joined by one of the nation's top legal officers in the area of civil rights, Deval Patrick. I have known Deval only a few years, but I feel I know him well, and I consider him to be a friend. Wise beyond his years, he is a man of principle and integrity. He is a family man with a deep conviction of equality for all. And he has worked long and hard to make this world a better place for his children and ours. Deval Patrick grew up in a segregated neighborhood on Chicago's South Side. He was not economically wealthy, but he was rich in faith, intellect, and family love. Despite his surroundings, he excelled academically, winning a scholarship to Milton Academy here in Massachusetts. In 1974, he was awarded another scholarship to Harvard College. He graduated cum laude with a degree in English and American literature. After traveling to Africa and working for a year, Deval Patrick returned to the United States to attend Harvard Law School where he graduated in 1982. Mr. Patrick began his legal career by clerking for a judge on the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. He then joined the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund in New York City, working as a staff attorney. There, he litigated a variety of civil rights cases, specializing in capital punishment and voting rights cases. In 1986, he joined a Boston law firm. Here he spent time working on pro bono civil rights matters while pursuing other civil and commercial cases. While working in private practice, he continued to work on behalf of the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund, serving on the New England Steering Committee of the fund, where we serve together, and serving as a director on the fund's national board and as a member of its executive committee. Today, Deval Patrick commutes to Boston to be with his family, but he works in Washington, D.C. as the Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights at the United States Department of Justice, an appointment he has held since 1994. He has been involved in several high-profile cases, including a landmark public accommodations settlement with Denny's Restaurants, and the first successful criminal prosecutions under the Freedom of Access to Clinic Entrances Act. Mr. Patrick has been a leader in the Clinton administration's examination of affirmative action, including contributions to the President's Affirmative Action Review. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce to you a leader among leaders, a man of action and deep conviction and someone who will always be on the side of truth and justice. The United States Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights, Deval Patrick. Thank you. Thank you all and thank you Vivian for that um, extravagant uh, introduction. I have been I've taken to, uh, to telling audiences that one of the perks of public life is that when you are introduced to speak somewhere, you get to have your accomplishments exaggerated. I, um, I appreciate the many compliments and hope someday to be worthy of them. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I run, as you heard, the Civil Rights Division of the United States Department of Justice. And we have a simple charge. That is to protect the opportunity that every American deserves by enforcing the laws that protect the civil rights of people of all backgrounds and races. And we do our part in this by fully and fairly enforcing all of the laws for which we have responsibility without favor and without fear. Despite strains on our resources and sometimes hostile courts or Congress, despite furloughs and shutdowns and budget uncertainties, we have managed in the last two years to start more investigations, file and win more cases, and resolve more problems in more areas of civil rights law than in any other time in the division's history. And I'm very, very proud of that. But in many ways, our job has really never been harder. Because if the American public is not careful, 
The national consensus and support of the great and continuing struggle for civil rights in this country will unravel. An essential feature of the national character will vanish. And the future our children inherit will be a sorry and desolate thing. At the age of almost 40, I usually admit that I am more of the 60s civil rights movement than I ever was actually in it. But it had a deep effect on my life, not just in tangible ways, but in intangible ways as well. I remember the time when I first heard Dr. Martin Luther King speak. He was addressing a crowd at a park on the south side of Chicago, and my mother took my sister and me to go hear him. I think I was about six or seven years old at the time, and candidly, I cannot remember a single word he said, not a single word. But I do remember the deep solemnity of the occasion, the sense that something important was happening. I remember feeling connected to all of the other people in that park, people like me of limited means but limitless hope. And I remember feeling the power of that hope, how it made us all feel motivated to give shape and purpose to the lives we were all trying to lead. There was a time, I think, when all of America felt the hope of Dr. King's message, when the problems we had created for ourselves were not viewed as beyond our capacity to care about and to solve. The, civil, the 60s civil rights struggle reminded us of the American promise of freedom for all, defined over time and over struggle by notions of equality, opportunity, and fair play. And it produced countless acts of compassion and courage and idealism, dramas now triumphantly written in the annals of American history. And for centuries, those very American ideals of equality, opportunity, and fair play have been confounded by the politics and practices of division and exclusion. Slowly, painstakingly, through the struggles of the 50s, 60s, and 70s, men and women of goodwill and perspective, people who faced up to the gulf between our reality and our ideals and came down on the side of our ideals, pressed for, cajoled, and demanded progress in closing that gap. And there is no denying the plain fact that we are a freer, more democratic, more prosperous society for more Americans today than ever before. And yet it is undoubtedly true that legions of racial and ethnic minorities and women feel less of a sense of opportunity, less assured of our equality, and less confident of fair treatment today than in many, many years. Now society's collective thinking on the meaning of opportunity seems to begin and end with the topic of affirmative action, and little of that debate is constructive. Now the specter of opinion polls and political agendas overshadows basic concepts of fair play and due process. The notion of equality is never even mentioned in public discourse today as if avoiding the subject avoids the problem. Some openly question whether the civil rights movement has gone too far and behave as if the history of America is a history of discrimination against white men. And many minorities, frankly, are asking openly whether integration was ever a valuable and worthwhile goal. But take a look at us. A good, plain, candid, honest look at us. The unemployment rate for black males is still twice as high as for white males. Even college-educated black and Hispanic men and women of every race and ethnic background are paid less than comparably educated, comparably trained white men. It's still harder for black folk and Latinos, and in many cases for women, to rent apartments, get a mortgage, get hired or promoted, in many cases even to vote, than for whites. Black churches are on fire again in Alabama and Tennessee, just like 30 years ago. A black nine-year-old in South Carolina recently was tied to a tree and terrorized by a white playmate and his parents. A 300-unit apartment building in Ohio had refused ever to rent to African Americans as of last year. A white congregation in Georgia last week was in an uproar 
because the body of a mixed-race infant was about to be buried in the churchyard against a whites-only policy that dated back to the 1800s. A six-foot cross was burned in front of a neighborhood auto repair and body shop in Florida because the white shop owner hired two black workers. Three white men in Texas drove to the black section of town, literally hunting African Americans, lured three to their car, and then shot them each at close range with a short-barreled shotgun, each one taking a turn at the trigger. A Louisiana Correction Center required a minimum passing score on the written examination of 90 for men, but 105 for women. In fact, one woman scored 100 on the exam but was disqualified, while a year later, a man was hired who scored a 79, even though he had a prior arrest and no high school diploma. In California, when two young Hispanic couples earned the chance to move literally across the railroad tracks to a better neighborhood, a condominium manager told them there was no room because Latinos, in his opinion, were given to multiplying, he said and he didn't want his building to become like the barrio they had come from. Swastikas deface tombstones and hate-filled slurs littered sports events in about six or seven known communities in Massachusetts last year. We all saw the videotape of Rodney King's ordeal and heard the racist and anti-Semitic rantings of Mark Furman. We know that police excesses are real in too many places in America today. I still get followed in department stores and harassed if I'm driving in the wrong neighborhood at the wrong time of day. I can't get a cab in a lot of major American cities. And these accumulated indignities, as insignificant as any one may seem, nag at my personhood every day, even in my rarefied life. Now imagine what kind of effect that has on the life and mind of a young African American or Hispanic man or woman who knows less about hope and faith than I do and have come to trust. We see intolerance on the rise. We see efforts to dismantle what national consensus there is on civil rights today and to divide us along racial and ethnic lines for political advantage or worse. Cynical measures like Proposition 187 out in California or mean-spirited euphemisms like the so-called Civil Rights Initiative in California or the so-called Equal Opportunity Act in Congress, both purporting to ban affirmative action outright despite our current realities, leave us wondering whether serious problems will ever be met by serious ideas. And let me assure you, these anxieties are not unique to minorities and women. They are shared by all Americans of goodwill and perspective of every race ethnicity, creed, and gender. The people are wondering and watching anxiously, like some of you perhaps, to see whether this country is about to make a giant lurch backward in its struggle for equal opportunity and fundamental fairness. Now, thanks to my colleagues at the Justice Department and to private lawyers and activists and good citizens throughout the country, not all is lost, that Ohio apartment complex and that California condominium have changed their rental policies and have new black and Latino tenants. That Louisiana Correction Center has, dis has qualified women on the payroll today. The three Texas gunmen, the Florida cross burner, and a couple of LAPD cops are all doing time in federal prisons. The banking industry tells us that our fair lending program, which we beefed up in the last two years, is responsible for last year's record high level of lending to minority borrowers across the country. Abortion clinic violence has slowed following our enforcement efforts. That's all good news, all good news. But it's not enough. Because the greater problem is not just that we, the lawyers and the activists, are facing a shortage of hands and money. The greater problem is that we, the American people, are forgetting who we are. People have come to these shores from all over the world, in all manner of boat, and built from a wilderness the most extraordinary society on earth. And we are most remarkable not just because of what we've accomplished, not just because of the material benefits we've accumulated, but because of the ideals to which we've dedicated ourselves. 
And we have defined these ideals over time with principles of equality, opportunity, and fair play. For this, at the end of the day, we are an inspiration to the world. Well, civil rights is the struggle for those ideals. It's hardly about some abstract racial spoil system. It's about breaking down artificial barriers of whatever kind to equality, opportunity, and fair play. It's about assuring everyone a fair chance to perform, redeeming that fundamentally American sense of hope, and affirming our basic values and aspirations to become a genuinely integrated nation. Now, I know, as you do, that future progress depends on the next generation, just as today's progress depends on us. Civil rights, as one friend of mine puts it, is a relay race for justice. Our forward movement as a society depends on the clarity and the perspective with which the next generation views the challenge and the creativity with which they undertake to address it. And that, in turn, depends on whether they understand and embrace American ideals of equality, opportunity, and fair play and are inspired to act on them. I found myself thinking a lot about the state of American ideals and idealists beginning last spring. It was my first spring kind of paying attention to life in Washington. Uh, and I noticed that in the springtime, the city is full of tourists, especially school children on class trips. The days are warm and long, the azaleas and the dogwoods are in their glory, and school children from across the country come to see their nation's capital. And when you see these kids standing in a place like the Capitol Rotunda, dressed in the style they call grunge, uh, speaking their own special slang, asking such profound questions as where the nearest McDonald's is, one might incline to wonder about whether the next generation will produce many idealists, many great statesmen and stateswomen, many compassionate leaders. But I am absolutely convinced they are there. They wear the dress and walk the walk and talk the talk of their time just as each of us has in ours. But some harbor a latent idealism beneath their contemporary version of cool, just like some of us. Some find themselves a little embarrassed by the simple majesty of the Declaration of Independence when they visit the National Archives, or a little uneasy, just a little uneasy, when they read the engravings on the walls of the Lincoln Memorial. Some linger a moment or two longer than the rest in the Capitol Rotunda, taking in the full impact of that scene. And in that extra moment of reflection, in that embarrassment and unease, lies a seed of idealism waiting to grow. If we don't nurture that idealism and encourage its growth, if we don't summon forth the better angels of their nature as others have in our time, then the purveyors of mendacious rhetoric and cynical politics will win the day and at unspeakable cost. In my time and in others, there were national purposes like civil rights and national heroes like Martin Luther King Jr. and Lyndon Johnson, who called upon our founder's idealism and met this nation with a challenge of conscience. And in fits and starts of courage and pain, we responded to that call and reached across our differences, if only for an instant, to seize our common humanity. Well, today, as in all other times, the human spirit is, this, is the same. Young people still harbor idealism, a little shyly, perhaps, and with veiled reticence. Even in the bleakest places, children still look for a reason to hope. And what shall we offer them? Who will call forth their idealism? Who will set his or her own discouragement and weariness aside long enough to light a fire of purpose under somebody else? Will history say of the legacy and the challenge we pass on to them that ours was the generation and the time that gave up on and lost interest in finally building a single unified nation? The challenge today is not solely one of race or of gender or of ethnicity or of religion. It's not solely one of economics or crime or education. All those are important. The challenge today is a challenge of citizenship. 
It's the need to reclaim American ideals and refresh our commitment to honor them. And that is not the work of public leaders alone. It is the work, if not also the duty, of each of us. Each of us influences someone else, often without realizing it, and it is within our power to make a difference if we're willing to pay attention to someone else, to take on their needs and their hopes. To illustrate my point, I want to share a story I often tell that Marion Wright Edelman tells about one school teacher named Jean Thompson and one fifth grade boy named Teddy Stollard. It goes this way. On the first day of school, Jean Thompson told her students, boys and girls, I love you all the same, but now teachers do lie. Little Teddy Stollard was a boy Jean Thompson did not like. He slouched in his chair, didn't pay attention, his mouth hung open in a stupor, his eyes were always unfocused, his clothes were must, his hair unkempt, and he smelled. He was an unattractive boy, and Jean Thompson did not like him. Now, teachers have records, and Jean Thompson had Teddy's. First grade, Teddy's a good boy. He shows promise in his work and attitude, but he has a poor home situation. Second grade, Teddy is a good boy. He does what he is told, but he is too serious. His mother is terminally ill. Third grade, Teddy is falling behind in his work. He needs help. His mother died this year. His father shows no interest. Fourth grade, Teddy is in deep waters. He is in need of psychiatric help. He is totally withdrawn. Christmas came to the fifth grade, and the boys and girls brought their presents and piled them on her desk. They were all in brightly colored paper, except for Teddy's. His was wrapped in brown paper and held together with scotch tape, and on it, scribbled in crayon, were the words, For Miss Thompson from Teddy. She tore open the brown paper, and out fell a rhinestone bracelet with most of the stones missing, and a bottle of cheap perfume that was almost empty. When the other boys and girls began to giggle, she had enough sense to put some of the perfume on her wrist, put on the bracelet, hold her wrist up to the other children and say, doesn't it smell lovely? Isn't the bracelet pretty? And taking their cue from the teacher, they all agreed. At the end of the day, when all the children had left, Teddy lingered, came over to her desk and said, Miss Thompson, all day long you smell just like my mother. And her bracelet, that's her bracelet, it looks real nice on you too. I'm really glad you like my presence. And when he left, she got down on her knees and buried her head in her chair, and she begged God to forgive her. The next day, when the children came, she was a different teacher. She was a teacher with a heart, and she cared for all the children, but especially those who needed help, especially Teddy. She tutored him and put herself out for him. By the end of the year, Teddy had caught up with a lot of the other children and was even ahead of some. Several years later, Jean Thompson got this note. Dear Miss Thompson, I'm graduating and I'm second in my high school class. I wanted you to be the first to know. Love, Teddy. Four years later, she got another note. Dear Miss Thompson, I wanted you to be the first to know. The university has not been easy, but I liked it. Love, Teddy Stollard. Four years after that, she got this note. Dear Miss Thompson, as of today, I am Theodore J. Stollard, MD. How about that? I wanted you to be the first to know. I'm going to be married in July. I want you to come and sit where my mother would have sat because you're the only family I have. Dad died last year. And you know, she went and she sat where his mother would have sat because she deserved to be there. She had become a decent and loving human being. Now, while we debate the abstract merits of colorblindness and the theories on either side of affirmative action as a means. There are millions of Teddy Stollards all over this country, millions, looking for a way up and a way in. Children who are left out and left back who will never become doctors or lawyers or teachers or police officers or little else because there was no Jean Thompson, no other teacher, no friend, maybe no one like you, who by action or example quietly inspired them, showed them 
how to look up rather than down. Help them to see their stake in their own and their neighbor's dreams and gave someone else a reason to hope. And what must we teach the next generation, if not also our own? That civil rights today is, as it has always been, a struggle for the American conscience. And that we all have a stake in that struggle. For we are tied together in the single garment of destiny, as Dr. King used to say, caught in an inescapable network of mutuality. And whatever affects one, affects all. So when an African American stands up for a quality integrated education, he stands up for all of us. When a Latina stands up for the chance to elect the candidate of her choice, she stands up for all of us. When a person who uses a wheelchair stands up for access to a public building, she stands up for all of us. When a Jew stands against those who desecrate his place of worship, he stands up for all of us. Because civil rights is still about affirming basic values and aspirations as a nation. It's still about the perennial American challenge to reach out to one another across the arbitrary and artificial barrier of race, across gender, across ethnicity, across disability and class and religion, and maybe most of all, across our fear and hopelessness to seize our common humanity and see our stake in that. This is a defining moment in American history, I think. Our young people are increasingly alienated from civic society, and too many of the rest of us have let political cynicism and private selfishness define our lives. From my travels in this job, I can confidently report that people all over America are looking for a reason to hope and watching anxiously to see whether this nation is still the society it dedicated itself to become. I say let them look to us, to you and to me, and let history record that we, in our time, faced our challenges, remembering who we are, and believing finally in that old adage that we are more than our brother's keeper, that on this earth we are his savior, and he is ours. Thank you very much. Now that I have the microphone, uh, let me say that my introduction was not only sincere, but it was deserved. Thank you, Duvall. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> At this time, Duvall Patrick will take questions in the Ford Hall Forum tradition, and there are microphones at the front of the hall in either aisle. And I would encourage you, if you have a, a brief comment or if you have a question not for him, now is the time to come forward. Um, it usually isn't a situation where everyone dashes to the microphone. What ends up happening is people then get moved and then choose to do it closer to the time we want to end. So think about what your question is. And um, I would like people still to keep their, their questions very brief so that we can get to as many people who have questions as possible. Um, I think that, Deval, you prefer to take your questions from the podium? Okay. Yes, sir. Hi. I was wondering if you could address the, uh, the recent court case, uh, Hopkins versus uh, University of Texas, Hopwood. and its effect on affirmative action programs? Yeah. Um, the, Hopwood, the Hopwood case is uh, a case out of the Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit um, that um, affirmed a district court opinion that declared a, what was in effect a dual affirmative action program, a dual admission pro uh, admissions program at the University of Texas Law School um, uh, unconstitutional. And the, the system that was challenged is a system where there was one, if I remember correctly, um, one admissions committee for 
majority students, and one admissions committee for minority students, and two different tracks for getting into the University of, uh, of Texas. By the way, by the time the case went to trial a couple of years ago, the University of Texas had abandoned that admissions uh, uh, plan. I don't think that that is a defensible admissions plan. Um, at but the Court of Appeals decision is dangerous um, on a couple of levels. Um, first of all, the Court of Appeals purports on its own to overrule um, a decision of the Supreme Court, which the Supreme Court has not overruled, that talks about the continuing lawfulness uh, of, of uh, efforts to integrate um, university and college uh, campuses by taking race and gender, race or gender, into account as long as you don't um, overwhelm um, uh, other factors um, that are relevant to, uh, uh, to admission, including, uh, including the ability to perform. The university, we are not a party to that case now. The United States is not a party to that case uh, just today. University uh, of Texas, through the Attorney General, has announced that they will seek review in the Supreme Court. If they do, I fully expect that we'll try to become a part of the case at that point. Thank you. Yes. If I understand their position would be is that in 1996, I haven't personally discriminated against. Mm -hmm. And given economic retrench uh, retrenchment, why should I, who have not been guilty of discrimination that may have happened 10 years ago, 15 years ago, or may e even sooner, but that I'm not practicing, why should I have to suffer when there aren't enough jobs around? Mm -hmm. And so I wonder, it's a theoretical, but I wonder how you can justify affirmative action mm -hmm. now? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, uh, I think on a couple of levels. First of all, I don't see the suffering um, that it is presumed uh, is seen by, by your hypothetical white middle class uh, male by affirmative action in a, in a shrinking job market. In other words, affirmative action has not explained. Uh, let, me, let me take it one, one step back. When times are tough, for everybody, historically and today, they have been three, four, five, ten times tougher for minority hires. Um, that is a that is a demographic fact. Uh, when nobody's hiring, affirmative action doesn't get you a job. If you are a minority person, you don't get a job because of affirmative action if nobody's hiring. If somebody's hiring, and that's that's why one of the and part of the bugaboo about affirmative action, I I shouldn't I should be more so part of the spin um, uh, about, uh, uh, by some of the, uh, or the, the, the argument um, by some who uh, oppose affirmative action is that it is responsible um, for wholesale disenfranchisement of the opportunities of, of, uh, uh, of white men. And the facts just don't bear that out. They just don't bear that out. The question is, what is a fair competition? Um, is it going to be fair, necessarily, if the ability to enjoy an opportunity, in other words, the ability to compete for that opportunity, is limited to people who, are, who come in through the old boy network or through private uh, uh, contacts or, or one, uh, of one kind or another? That's out there. That's a part of, that's a part of life. Uh, but is that... If we leave that, if we leave the, work, uh, the workplace to those forces alone, is that in our national best interest? Um, and I, our conclusion, the president's conclusion, is that it isn't. I also should say a word, if I'm, if I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to take so long with your, with your question, but uh, I also want to say a word about what I'm talking about on affirmative action, because I think one of the things that happens in this debate is people jump to their positions before they define what it is they're talking about. Affirmative action is really a range of remedies, as I, probably you all know. On one end of the spectrum, um, there is outreach and recruitment, the idea of casting a broad net for people who can perform um, in, in both traditional and non-traditional, the old boy network. Few people object to that, at least openly. On the other end of the, of the spectrum 
is something that masquerades as affirmative action and is not what the courts have uh, permitted. And that's the quota business. That's the, that's the hard and fast numbers of places in a workplace or a, or, a, or a campus that are reserved for particular kinds of people, regardless of quality, regardless of merit. Those are the quotas that the president and I and everybody else has said we don't favor. We're not for that. And more importantly, that the, that the courts have consistently rejected. So this business about you know, how affirmative action is about quotas and all that, all that, that's off the table as a legal matter. When there have been such programs brought to our attention in the Justice Department, we have challenged them, uh, as a matter of fact, as unlawful. There is a method in the middle, which I call affirmative consideration. This is really back to the uh, gentleman's point about, about, the, about the Hopwood decision. This is the notion that um, race or ethnicity or gender can be considered among other factors when you're evaluating among qualified candidates. It may not necessarily be dispositive. It is not a guarantee. It cannot compromise merit because the idea is you're looking at a couple of people who are equal or close to equal. Um, uh, there probably is rarely you know, genuine equality. Uh, I, you know, I, common sense suggests, uh, uh, suggests that. But that when you are making those decisions, you are also taking into account your ambition to integrate your workforce or integrate your campus. And you make those judgments. And you know, by the way, their affirmative action in other forms has existed for hundreds and hundreds of years in this country. There's always been affirmative action. I went to Harvard. There's always been affirmative action for legacy kids at, uh, at Harvard. There's affirmative action for um, kids from Sioux City, Iowa. I had a roommate from Sioux City, Iowa because they were interested in geographic, or from Paris, um, uh, what have you. The affirmative action has been extended to minorities and women relatively recently. Um, the question is, if opportunities are available, not one group's opportunity trumping somebody else's group, but if opportunities are available generally, what steps are we willing to take in the interest of integrating mainstream American life? Affirmative action is a tool for that. And I think if it is done the right way with a common sense uh, uh, approach and done well and with integrity, it's for it's in the country's long-term best interest. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. I'm sorry to be so long-winded. Yes, sir. I was just curious if you could maybe uh, flesh out a little bit about how your division operates. You mentioned in passing at one point, I think you said perhaps that you're underfunded, and, and I suppose you're probably overworked and the demands are great, but to what extent do you have the luxury of being proactive in seeking cases that might have broad uh, generalizability? Uh, or are you simply receiving cases which must be numerous uh, and handling the best you can as they come in? To what extent can you take a more proactive uh, forward uh, it's approach? A, it's, a, it's a little of both and not enough of the proactive. Um, when, when I first got there, we, um, we undertook something called the long-range planning effort. Excuse me. And we, um, uh, our, effort, our objective was to look at the authority we have under federal law, look at the different sections, we're divided into 10 litigating sections, look at the resources of each of those uh, sections and the types of complaints that come to us and define a two, two or three real problems, not theories we were trying to advance, but genuine real life problems that we could bear down on uh, and just say a hard uh, no to the other kinds of uh, other kinds of cases, uh, and we di did that in a couple of uh, 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 areas: the uh, lending discrimination, the fair lending program in the housing section, for example, under the <clears throat> fair lending laws, um, is an objective that we put in uh, in place that reflects that, and we've been very proactive in uh, in that sense. Then the Congress changed, and frankly, um, uh, and this is not a this uh, I, this is not a partisan point. This is a fact of life. Everything changed. We were on, uh, well, a lot changed. We were put on the defensive. Our funding was in jeopardy. Then the furloughs came and all that business, which is incredibly disruptive. Um, and uh, we had to confront that. Um, meanwhile, unrelated to that entirely, there are a handful of of the 20 or so statutes we're responsible for enforcing that give us no discretion. We have to handle whatever uh, uh, matter comes into us from one of the referring uh, agencies. So it's constantly, you know, and then 
there's some big problem in the newspaper that, and the president says we got to do something about this and or the AG does. I have a lot of bosses or the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee and and there you go. So it's a it's a combination of of the proactive and the and the reactive. Yes, sir. Cannon's campaign. <laughs> were you were you really dismayed that a solid twenty twenty five percent of America was really buying into him, or are you ultimately heartened that? someone a little bit more mainstream is going to get the nomination even if it makes it harder for your boss? Huh. Um, well, I'm new to politics, so I don't hold myself out as a political, uh, political expert. Um, a few personal rules. I don't gloat over losers. I just, I don't do that. Uh, I don't, um, I try not to be hysterical. Um, Pat Buchanan scares the bejesus out of me. Um, David Duke scares me a little bit more. And David Duke is doing very well in Louisiana and is running for the Senate. That is real life. Um, and I, 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 when, I, when I say that is real life, I, I really want to emphasize that uh, uh, we spend a great deal of time in this country, off your point please, for sure. a moment. We spend a great deal of time in this country arguing about abstract theories for enforcement of civil rights or civil rights ideas and affirmative action is a perfect example without thinking them through in the context of current reality. And the context of current uh, uh, reality um, in some parts of the country is very supportive of David Duke, and David Duke is very on, you know, very upfront uh, about uh, uh, about his uh, about his views. Um, beyond that, I don't know if I have anything to say about the Buchanan campaign. I, I don't, as far as I can tell, the Buchanan campaign isn't really what, over. Just as a thought, what would you tell a, if you were locked in an elevator with someone who really felt? disenfranchised by the way the economy is going topsy-turvy nowadays and feels that someone like Buchanan is the only one speaking to that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think race relations and the economic malaise that a lot of us are facing nowadays are very closely entwined. Well, look, uh, I mean, this, this is a, well, I guess I could say something glib, but I won't. Um, <laughs> I, was just, I was just, well, never mind. Okay. Um, <laughs> look, we, we, I, can you think of any can you think of any society where it has been in the society's interest to divide people at times of crisis this may be an this may be a time of economic crisis i'm not sure it's that bad but in certainly in lots of in, in, in lots of individual families it's real bad um, um, Vivian Beer was suggesting that people drop envelopes, um, and I can't make a plug for the F Ford Hall Forum, but I can tell you that the commute back and forth to Washington makes me want to ask you to drop envelopes <laughs> for me um, right. back there. And that, I mean, the, the, the people are struggling. I'm struggling. Um, I, under, I understand that. I don't think, I, you know, I think community depends on people sticking together when it's tough, too. Uh, and I think that building community is risky, risky, because you have to reach out to people you don't know, may, maybe don't want to know, right. seem a little different from, uh, 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 from you. But I think that's the way neighborhoods work. I think that's the way successful cities work. I think that's the way states ultimately we ha will have to work. And I think that's the way this country has to work at some level. And I think in the few instances in history when it has worked, when there has been that sense that we were connected in a common enterprise, we have soared. Mm -hmm. We have absolutely soared. Uh, and I, so I, my sense is that that ultimately is where the solution lies, not in kind of pointing at each other as, as, a, as the cause of, you know, my particular hardship. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Um, opinion is um, on whether and if so how the best uh, Effect, the most effective approaches or the best forums for addressing civil rights issues have changed. Um, I guess I'm thinking particularly in light of 
some of the changes in the attitudes and openness or sympathy to civil rights issues in the federal courts. Mm -hmm. um, what you, whether, whether you think there's a change there, and if so, where do you think the best, what, where are the best places to be addressing these things, and, and how? Okay, uh, well, we still do pretty well in the lower federal courts. Um, in fact, we have overall a higher success rate than ever before in uh, division history. Um, we are not in a hurry to bring a lot to the Supreme Court. Uh, right now depends on the case and the problem the problem is frankly um, and with due respect to the court um, they're not consistently acting like judges they you know you take a case there that is grounded on a decision they made recently and the, and they may decide they're going to change the rules entirely uh, and say uh, little if anything about the case that they are overlooking except except they, don't, they won't come right out and say they're overruling it um, so we make we make judgments about cases that we uh, we want to take to the Supreme Court. Now we we don't have complete control over that because the voting cases, for example, go automatically on appeal <clears throat> directly to the Supreme Court from the from the trial court. Many many state courts are more active today in uh, in uh, civil rights enforcement. Some on our side of the question, some not. We don't have any authority in the, in the United States Department of Justice to begin a case in the state courts. We have to take our cases to the, um, to the federal courts. <clears throat> but we are working um, cooperatively uh, with many state attorneys general, again, for the first time in history, on proactive uh, civil rights enforcement. A number of state attorneys general, for example, are, have been interested in bringing fair lending cases in there. Uh, communities, and we've helped with that. We've also been involved in many of the um, disability rights uh, questions. And then there are, there are state laws that go broad, that go further than federal laws. For example, there is no federal um, prohibition against discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. Nothing. Zip. Doesn't exist. It does exist in many uh, in many states and and local ordinances. So we try to make those judgments on a case by case basis. And if it's uh, if we think the case is best served, um, or we have, well, if we think the case is best served, then we bring it in the federal court. If we don't, then we may uh, steer it to someone else. Yes, sir. On a lighter note, that's a great tie. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It's a Christmas gift. Um, my personal take out on the street is that overwhelmingly what I have heard is that Adirond Construction versus Pena, in terms of reverse discrimination, was the righting of a wrong, in a sense. Mm -hmm. Not that um, affirmative action or any kind of type of civil rights move was becoming a conundrum and should be looked at in another way, but mm -hmm. rather, in a sense, that a goal had been reached, gone beyond, and now, <clears throat> excuse me, mm -hmm. it's time to turn this thing around. Mm -hmm. I find that appalling, and I find it essentially almost universal hmm. of people that I, t not necessarily in stock terms, but conceptually, mm -hmm. that's how I hear it being talked about. Mm -hmm. and I was wondering what the sounding was in Washington. What, what's, what's the feel of that? Of the decision? Not the, or the decision. What, what I've just said to you, that I hear that on an ongoing basis. Mm -hmm. And I find that very unsettling. Mm -hmm. Well, there is a lot of that. I, I mean, I certainly pick up a lot of that kind of been there, done that uh, attitude uh, when it comes to um, to the notion of opportunities for uh, minorities and women. You know, kind of, we've kind of taken care of that problem. We've got to move on to, uh, uh, to something else. And Adirond um, was, was the... Uh, uh, well, it was, it was heralded, I think, by many who shared that attitude. Mm -hmm. who, who felt. Of course, Adirond doesn't say what uh, a lot of people say it says. Mm -hmm. uh, it does not um, uh, declare all affirmative action unconstitutional per se. In fact, it didn't even declare the program at issue in that case unconstitutional. Um, to the contrary, it said race could be taken into, uh, into account in certain circumstances. That wasn't the one. 
Um, I think that, the, that it's also important for people who support affirmative action, lawyers or otherwise, not to feel as though they have to support every affirmative action plan. Some are better than others. Some are more uh, uh, successful than, uh, uh, than others. But I think to the general point about, um, about the sense that we have finished with, uh, um, with, uh, with the civil rights struggle, I guess I would, I guess that's the sort of thing I was trying to speak to in, in my text. Um, if you just look around, just look around at two things. Look around at the problems that are still around to the extent you can find out about them if they are, uh, if they are reported. This is a sampling of the stuff that comes across my desk every day, every day. Um, and also look around at who still dominates most American institutions. Um, it's more often people like you than people like me. Now that isn't necessarily right or wrong, that's the way it is. Um, and there are lots of people like me who want to be a part of mainstream American uh, uh, institutions. If you don't care, if you don't care that your fellow citizens want the same opportunities that you may have, then it is very easy, then all the rest of it falls into place. It's very easy to say we don't need affirmative action, we don't need Patrick, we don't need the Civil Rights Division and so forth. If you do care about whether your fellow citizens um, are able to partake of some of the same kinds of opportunities uh, that you have, and if you believe that that is still a part of the American mm -hmm. promise, if that is still a part of an inherent part of the American experience, um, then it seems to me you got to looking you got to be looking for all kinds of tools um, that make sense um, to try to bring people in and together. That's my thank response. you. Sure. Sure. Work with the voting rights legislation. What, what do you think about the uh, merits of the congressional uh, redistricting to help minorities uh, get into office? Well, I think, um, I think we have defended many of those cases um, on a, for, for, particular, for, for a particular reason, and, and it is this. We don't believe, I don't believe, that a so-called majority-minority district, which means a district that is drawn, a congressional district that is drawn where minority voters are in the majority. Um, should be drawn everywhere it can be. Uh, I think the I think the you know the Congress is a better place because it's gotten mixed up and there are different kinds of perspectives and so forth uh, uh, brought there. But but we have never supported the idea that a that such a district could be drawn simply because it was possible to draw such a district. We have said that under the Voting Rights Act, such a district was an appropriate choice by a state legislature where the politics were already so racially polarized, so racially polarized, that it wouldn't be possible for the minority um, voters to be able ever to elect a candidate of choice or participate meaningfully in the democracy. And there are still places where that happens. In North Carolina, one of the cases that's being litigated now, and the court has it under uh, uh, submission um, since the fall, there was a poll indicating, as a, as a part of the evidence, indicating that a that 80 percent of the white electorate in the relevant community would not black vote for a black candidate if the black candidate were the only candidate on the ballot. 80 percent. I mean that, that that is a reality that has to be uh, that has to be uh, dealt with. And as a practical matter, because the politics were so uh, polarized in that place, when there were white um, uh, uh, representatives, they did not pay attention to the um, interests of the minority voters. The, the districts are, are um, you know, they're described as, in, I mean, the rhetoric is very heated um, out, of the, out of the Supreme Court. They're described as, um, as um, segregating voters by, by race and so forth. They, these are the most integrated districts in the country. You know, b roughly half, a little bit more than half, are minority voters, in some cases, conglomerates of different uh, uh, racial and ethnic uh, minorities. And in order for the politics to work, they have to make coalitions across racial lines. Uh, and they do. So um, 
We think that they make sense and are appropriate under the Voting Rights Act in some places, but not everywhere. And we have defended them where we thought they were appropriate uh, and where we thought they were lawful. And ironically, of course, these are plans that have been created and voted into effect by predominantly white state legislatures finally trying to respond to their own, uh, to their own issues. Uh, you know, in this area, if anything, about the most one can say is that what is up is down and what is white is black now. It's just all completely backwards. And the court hasn't said the final word on it yet. Thank you. Just a quick question. In the state of uh, Massachusetts, you um, must have car insurance if you have a car. But people in poor communities have to pay more than people in wealthier suburbs. Uh, do you see that as a violation of civil rights? Do you see it as something that could be challenged successfully it, in court? Well, the first question, is it a violation of civil rights? It could be. Um, I'd have to know more. Um, can it be challenged in federal courts? Um, car insurance, probably not by the United States. There is a private right of action that may be available. But the authority of the United States, we have done insurance cases, but they've been property insurance cases under the Fair Housing Act in just those circumstances, actually, where the, where the quality of the policies and the price per dollar of coverage uh, was quite a bit more favorable in one place than another, and the difference in, it, in a majority community than a minority community, and the difference could not be explained by differences in risk, uh, a risk uh, evaluation or, um, or, um, or experience. Uh, and we've addressed that now in two cases. It has incredibly rattled the insurance industry, and they've had a They've been yelling at Congress, but uh, we, were, we had them dead to rights in both cases. On car insurance, though, <clears throat> there is no federal, there's no complementary federal authority yet for the United States, but there may be claims that an individual can bring under, it could be even be under federal law, but it's not something that the Justice Department can pursue. Okay. Okay. Thank you. and sharing his insights, his experience, and for being so forthcoming. Um, again, if you can join me in a, a round of applause for his uh, appearance this evening. I appreciate it very much. For you to consider, please, becoming a member of the Ford Hall Forum. Uh, there is a schedule of the uh, spring series in the back. If you choose to look at what the other guests are lined up to, um, to speak on and uh, where we plan to have them, our next speaker will be Harvard Law Professor Alan Dershowitz, and he will appear at Faneuil Hall on April 18th. Thank you all for coming. Good night. Thank you.